When it comes to the word globalization, naturally we bring one country into our conversation, which is China. Now today, the nation of 1.4 billion people and also is on this path towards economic prosperity. Well, needless to say that politically speaking, China recently, even before the pandemic and especially post the pandemic, this country has generated much greater noises. Not only under the current leader Xi Jinping, but also in terms of expanding its influence all the way across the countries in Europe and also in the Middle East. If you follow the news closely, that you might realize the two countries are continually making noises at the same time. One is the nation of Iran, and the other one is Saudi Arabia. Both countries have been long considered as the good relationship partners with China, but this time those two countries seem to grow much closer because of the presence of China. And how should we understand all of that? And what about the role of Iran today under the influence of China? Should U.S. come up with better strategies in order to make better peace, or should we say make more harmonious for the world? Well, ladies and gentlemen, in order to answer all the questions, please allow me to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Professor Jim Sheet. Chaksi. Again, Professor Chaksi is a distinguished professor and interim chair of the Department of Central Eurasian Studies and also the director of Inner Asian and Euralic National Resources Center at Indiana University. Again, if you follow Dr. Chaksi's work, and lately he came up with the article which is entitled "Iran is breaking out of its box." Washington must find new ways to counter Tehran's regional influence. Well, Dr. Chaksi, and welcome to the missing piece. Welcome. Thank you so much. Well, again, Professor, as we mentioned before, I want to get started with a simple question. Within the article you mentioned, on June the sixth of this year, Iran's embassy reopened in Saudi Arabia. Now, help us with better understanding. How significant was it? And also, how should we understand the current relationship between Iran and Saudi? Good question, Mel. In fact, the the relations between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and actually Iran and the rest of the countries of the Persian Gulf, even of the mid- Arab countries of the Middle East, has been deteriorating since 1979, since the Iranian Revolution that overthrew the Shah. The Arab countries were afraid that the Iranian Revolution would export to their nations. And oust the Arab Gulf monarchies.、Mm. So there was deterioration there. Then, in addition, Iran started challenging Saudi Arabia's control of the Grand Mosque at Mecca, the central holy place for all Muslims, the site of the annual Hajj pilgrimage.、Uh, an Iran-instigated、uh, rebellion at the Grand Mosque in Mecca、uh, resulted in numerous deaths.、Mm. Uh, subsequent to that, Saudi Arabia. Executed a Saudi Arabian Shia cleric for meddling in politics.、Mm. After that happened, that seven years ago, when that execution occurred in Saudi Arabia, Iranian mobs ransacked the Saudi embassy in Tehran. Sort of shades of what had happened after the Iranian Revolution with the American embassy.、Mm. Uh, they also burned the Saudi consulates in other Iranian cities. At that point, Saudi Arabia severed relations. Tossed Iranian diplomats out, and since then, not only have there been tensions between the two countries, the two countries have engaged in proxy wars.、Mm. Iran and Iran and、uh, Saudi Arabia fought each other in Syria. They have been fighting each other in Yemen.、Mm. Uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen have launched missi- Iranian missiles at Saudi cities.、Uh, Iranian drones have attacked Saudi Aramco facilities. So tensions really have been building up,、mm. and it's into that mix there's been an attempt to diffuse、uh, these tensions. There were meetings in、uh, Baghdad, and then those meetings eventually switched over to Beijing.、Mm. It appeared that both Saudi Arabia and China needed a superpower、mm. to not just broker the final deal, but also to be the guarantor of the final deal.、Mm. And the United States couldn't be that because of、uh, United States being closely allied with Saudi Arabia. 
and having long tensions since 1979 with Iran. And Russia couldn't do that because particularly with the war in Ukraine, Russia has come to be actually de militarily dependent on Iran mm. for technology. So China wa was the one superpower that could do that. In addition, of course, China is not directly in the region mm. like the US and like Russia. Mm. So China was in a sense ideally situated diplomatically and geopolitically to be uh, the power broker in this case. Mm. Interestingly speaking, Professor, again, as we mentioned before, when we talk about this economic prosperity and also this political growth of China, there's no denying this ambition under the current administration or the current leader in China. It's, I guess I want to be careful, the word is unstoppable. Now, meanwhile, few of us actually understand this relationship between China and Iran today. I want to start in this uh, in this conversation. Again, Professor, I'm sure you also follow the news that not too long ago, Iran was also successfully admitted to the Shanghai Economic Corporation, which almost shook the entire world because we know that on one hand china is looking for partners china is expanding its influence but on the list there are many countries names on the list in terms of to be additional member but iran was able to be admitted as the priority should i say so again professor what is the relationship between China and Iran today, and also how significant, how important it is for Iran to be admitted to the Shanghai Economic Cooperation. What do you say to that? So here's the base. The, I, I would say the, 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 in a nutshell, the fundamental aspect of this relationship is energy. Mm. China needs energy, oil and gas. Mm. And uh, there are limited uh, sources from which China can get this uh, directly. Uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and the other countries of the Persian Gulf are one direct mm. pipeline, uh, and it's a, a maritime pipeline, essentially, if you wish to, that brings the, the, the oil wire tankers mm. uh, through the Persian Gulf, through the, the, the Gulf of Oman, the Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, uh, to, to China is vital for China's continued growth. Mm. And therefore, for China to have stability in that region is extremely important. Mm. And so brokering the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran, admitting Iran into organizations that over which China mm. has a great deal of influence and control is very important. Mm. But Professor, realistically speaking, again, throughout the media coverage and also when we talk about the nation of Iran today, we have been watching the social instability and also this political, what I guess what we called unsatisfactory attitude among the citizens. But meanwhile, from the Chinese perspective, again, it's crystal clear that Chinese government never shows any interest in meddling any international affairs or so never ma uh, interested in um, interfering, should we say, any other country's domestic chaos or domestic disorganization. So again, Professor, how should we understand Iran's social instability today? And also, what are the reasons from your perspective from, and also according to your expertise that China is willing to stay out of this way? So in other words, to say, that's your problem, that's your issue, I'm not going to put my finger in this pie, but meanwhile, I still want to maintain or to be a good friend of yours. How can we understand all of that? So Iran's internal problems are ultimately economic and social. Mm. Uh, e uh, economic is essentially domestic uh, corruption mm. and mismanagement. Mm. A, a combination of corruption and mismanagement uh, has uh, crippled the Iranian economy. Uh, while the Iranians, uh, while the Iranian government may blame sanctions, it's actually their own internal mm. problems that have uh, crippled the economy. So that's one aspect of the internal problems. The other is we are looking with Iran. You're looking at a population mm. which is largely under the age of forty, mm. 
the, these are these are people who have grown up after the Islamic Revolution, mm. so they don't know the dictatorship of a Shah. Mm. They know the autocracy of a fundamentalist Islamic regime that tells them how to dress, how to speak, how to interact, mm. and at the same time cannot provide them with jobs. Mm. So, th so that is the, the fundamental problem within Iran, and it's a problem that has been gr that periodically has burst out into the open with uh, public protests, with violent uh, attempts by the Iranian go government to quash these. Now, China indeed has stayed out of it. That has been China's policy. Mm. There are positives to that, in that China is therefore able to work with the regime in Tehran and bring the regime in Tehran, to, for example, to international international table as it did with the Saudi deal. Mm. There are, of course, potential blowbacks. The United States took the same approach with Iran prior to 1979, letting the Shah internally mismanage his economy mm. and letting the Shah get away with repressing his people. The net result was that we had a re revolution in which the next regime in Iran did not fare well with the United States. Mm. Now, Professor, again, I want to move on to our next conversation. Since we talk about the relationship between China and Iran, now I want to bring Saudi Arabia into our conversation. Now, again, help us with better understanding. We know not too long ago, the Chinese leader also paid a brief visit to Saudi Arabia and also uh, so many important deals. And also, you know, we, we talk about uh, uh, this business and also this diplomatic relation happened between the two countries. Again, help us with better understanding. What is the relationship between China and Saudi Arabia today? And also, is it more meaningful or is it equally significant compared with the relationship between Iran and China today? What is the story behind that? I think the way we can see the relationship between China and Saudi Arabia is that it is a developing one, which may in time catch up with the relationship between China and Iran. Mm -hmm. China and Iran have had a longer relationship. In fact, one can say that China and Iran have had a historical relationship that goes back many, many centuries, uh, you know, back to not just the Middle Ages, but to antiquity. The Silk Road mm -hmm. is one good example of that. So the, the, the understanding between the Iranian people and the Chinese people is thousands of years old. Mm. The, the relationship that's developing between Saudi Arabia, uh, the people of the Arabian Peninsula and China is relatively new. It's one that's going to, uh, to take time to develop, but at the same time, not Saudi Arabia is a, not just a potential, but an actual source of energy for China. And the same, at the same time, Saudi Arabia is an increasing market for Chinese goods, mm. Chinese electronics, other technology, uh, Chinese construction. But also, let's keep something in mind. China is the largest exporter of halal meat to the Muslim world. Mm. And so uh, China uh, is increasingly playing a fundamental role in the economies of these countries, including Saudi Arabia. So it is not surprising to see that relationship develop mm -hmm. and that relationship will continue to grow. Uh, the, the question that remains is, as it develops, how does Saudi Arabia balance its global position mm -hmm. and also balance, it, balance its, its special relationship, which still exists? with the United States, because the United States is ultimately the security guarantor mm. of Saudi Arabia. Mm. And China has shown uh, ultimately no desire to actually be physically present in a military sense in the Persian Gulf. In your article, again, you mentioned that Washington must find new ways to counter Tehran's regional influence. I think it's better for us to start with the question is, why is it difficult today for the U.S. administration to counter 
Tehran's regional influence. I mean, again, too often when we think about the nation of Iran, we think about human rights violation, we think about economic instability or political chaos, and also, of course, that for so long uh, in this political realm, we talk about this Iran deal, those buzzwords throwing back and forth. But I think the fundamental question, Professor, to you is, why is it today so difficult for Washington to come up with more effective and also meaningful ways to counter or even try to reduce the influence from Taiwan? And what do you say to that? So I would say that the it's not just Washington. I think it is difficult for uh, in, increasingly in the world mm. for any, any nation or any superpower to completely contain any other nation, even a very troublesome nation mm. within a box. So despite the fact that Iran, until very recently, was directly and indirectly attacking Saudi Arabia, mm. the Saudis realized Iran is uh, in the top three in terms of proven reserves for oil and gas. Mm. And the world, despite the movements towards green energy, is still going to be dependent on petrochemicals for a long, long time. So that's number one. Number two, Iran, uh, the Iranian people are well-trained, highly educated, highly technological capable, and they want to interact with the world. Mm. That's the second point. The third point is that the United States understands that Iran, the, uh, not the Iranian people, but that the Iranian regime Mm. is the source of the problems. Mm. The United States does want to have a viable route that permits the Iranian people mm. to find a better path for themselves. Mm. That's also a desire shared by other nations. Mm. So within that mix, what you see is that it's difficult to constrain Iran. The, the danger is, does not come from the Iranian people. It comes from whether that regime will use its technological prowess. For example, Iran is essentially at the threshold of nuclear capability. Mm. Now, now, the United States and China and even Russia so far have been responsible nuclear superpowers. Iran does make threats. It's made threats against Saudi Arabia, mm. against Israel, uh, de depending on how, how the leaders in Tehran feel on a particular day, they, they even their press uh, makes makes threats mm. and so that's part of the problem is how does one make iran a good global citizen mm. now maybe this deal that china helped broken will further that the fear is that iran is playing nice to reclaim its international spot and then will turn against the Arab Gulf nations. And if that were to happen, that would be catastrophic, not just for the United States, but for China as well. Mm. Professor, I got two more questions before letting you go. Now, let's talk sure. about, we know today, when we look at foreign policy, particularly from the Chinese perspective and also from the US perspective. Now, let me th say this at the front, the relationship between China and U.S. today surely is standing at the crossroads. And despite some of the scholars or international political scientists uh, disagree with me, but I think today both countries are walking on a thin ice when we're looking at this relationship. Now, by admitting, again, going back, by admitting Iran into this Shanghai Economic Cooperation and also building better partners with Saudi Arabia and also Iran, do you think, or how much do you think, Professor, this actually elevated the Chinese international status? So in other words, make the U.S. more difficult and even more challenging to position itself when we are looking at this regional influence from Iran and also looking at this better strategies for U.S. to deal with Iran or Saudi Arabia in the long run. What do you say to that, Professor? So here's what I'll say. Uh, the relationship between the United States and China ebbs and flows. Mm. There are high points. There are low points. Ultimately, I would say the security aspect between China and the United States, the economic relationships mm. are far greater than any relationship the United States will have with Iran or mm. any relationship 
Beijing will have with Tehran. Mm. And so, so in a sense, yes, admitting Iran into international organizations does broaden China's reach. Mm. It does enhance China's stature. Mm. But I, I don't. I, but I think in terms of comparative uh, value. Uh, whether it is geopolitically, militarily, economically, etc., uh, the what I think we see right now between the United States and China are tussles that occur between great powers. Mm. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, I think I think that ultimately, we are, uh, let's put it like this: if Iran were to become or return to or become a, a major troublemaker again. Mm. I think you you'll find that China will work at the very least behind the scenes mm. to to uh, to constrain Iran, if for nothing else but for its own interests. Mm. In other words, Iran can be valuable to China, mm. but if it were to, for example, the Iranians on a regular basis threaten to cut off the shipment of any tankers through the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz. Now that would be completely unacceptable to China, mm. uh, just like it would be unacceptable to the United States. So I think there is also that aspect where yes, Iran's reach has broadened, but I think that China will move to make sure that Iran stays at least partially within that box. Mm. <laughs> for, 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 for the for global good, China's good, and for everyone's good. Absolutely, Professor. I want to go back to the article again. In the article, you mentioned that Iran is expanding its alliance with Russia and China, and over the years, that Tehran has brazenly sought to seize tankers transporting Saudi Arabia and UAE. Again, when we talk about Russia today, there is no doubt that we're looking at the war in Ukraine, and Russia, Professor. Let's be honest, has fewer and fewer friends. And a lot of countries are willing to be a bench players or are willing to cut off ties with Russia, particularly with even the current leader of Vladimir Putin. But again, is Iran playing a very dangerous game by making or forming alliance with China and Russia? And again, I mean, in this re in this reality, Professor, I think you can agree with me that it's rather to have a good friend. Rather to gain an enemy or unnecessary enemy, so is Iran actually playing the game fairly by gaining alliance with Russia, or Iran is actually experimenting something new and able to test the water within the international community? What do you say to that? So here's、uh, here's what I want you to keep in mind: Iran has had a, a, a Longer, more stable relationship with Russia,、mm. particularly after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Then, especially, of course, more far better than it's had with the United States. But also, it's had a more more stable, longer relationship with Russia than with China.、Mm. China's relationship with China is one that's growing. But at the same time as the relationship with China has grown, the war in Ukraine has has further enhanced Iran's relationship with Russia.、Mm. So Iran is playing a dangerous game in essentially providing Russia、mm. with military technology,、uh, and、uh, and and the Russians, of course, are forced to accept this technology, and therefore. Uh, shall we say the power balance with Russia has become inverted? Iran is more influential,、mm. not so with China, and certainly not so with the United States. So the the question remains in the long run. Once events work their way out in Ukraine,、mm. and Russia has to re-stabilize,、mm. where is that going to leave Iran?、Mm. And and so maybe this is the point at which Iran is. Increasingly looking at China to counterbalance the vacuum that that is occurring as Russia is is frankly showing itself to not have, to not be a superpower.、Mm. Professor, I, I want to wrap up our conversation by asking you one more question. Again, the end of the article you titles the U.S. must respond. Again, you mentioned that in June, John Kirby, a spokesperson for the U.S. National Security Council, and I said 
nonchalant, nonchalantly, and I quote, if more integration, more dialogue, and more transparency throughout the region can de-escalate tensions, and that will be all to the positive, end quote. Is this the only solution that we can come up right now? Again, we're looking at more dialogue, more transparency and more integration. So, Professor, again, how much can we expect this effectiveness if this is the response from the U.S. or if this is the mutual solution between Iran and U.S. at this moment? What do you say to that? So, in some ways, that would appear to be an excellent solution. Mm. Dialogue, de-escalation of tensions, uh, uh, integration of Iran back into the region, uh, Iran works with Saudi Arabia instead of fighting with Saudi Arabia. The U.S., China, Iran, Saudi Arabia are essentially able to stabilize the region together. Energy flows continue. That sounds like a win-win all around. Mm. The fly in the ointment is that Iran does, is not consistent. Mm. The leaders in Tehran are not consistent. They go back to forth. They interfere. They don't interfere. They threaten. What happens if Iran essentially decides for its own internal dynamics? Written, remember, a lot of what we see as foreign policy is driven by internal dynamics. Mm. So Iran right now is rushing to China and rushing to Saudi Arabia because it needs economic support, economic enhancement to placate its people mm. who are rebelling against the regime. Mm. What happens if the regime takes a different point of view? Mm. Or what happens if the regime decides that the way it should respond is to be hostile in the Persian Gulf? That's the danger. That's why when we look at it, we say, look, the US has to be present there in a military sense. China is not present there in a military sense. Mm. If, if Iran were to move, were to, to actually, it's just Iran does mine oil or we've seen them put limpet mines on oil tankers we've seen them seize oil tankers we've seen them threaten shipments what happens if they go a step further they attempt to blockade mm. that would that would shape the entire world economy mm. you can make up for persian gulf oil whether it's from iran saudi Arabia, etc even within a year so that's so the, the point is the united states has to be present china is not present in a military mm. sense Russia is not capable at, at this point. So that is the great danger is that we are looking at a regime which we hope through the Chinese presence, through, uh, through working with Saudi Arabia, etc., will return to the world stage mm. and be a rational player. That's the great unknown with Iran. And, and so that's where we, we, we sort of can end hoping that they will continue on the correct path hoping they will integrate, hoping their membership in the Shanghai Corporation will also compel them to be a responsible player. Mm. But with the regime in Tehran, unfortunately, we never really know. Well, again, Dr. Chaksky, I, I agree with you 100% because we're living in the world post the pandemic. I guess we're looking at unpredictability, uncertainty, and of course, when we we'll look at the country of Iran and look at the country of Saudi Arabia, continually we need to pay attention to this political order and also look at the social uh, prosperity along with China and the U.S. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Dr. Jim Sheet. Chucksky. Again, Dr. Chucksky, it's a distinguished professor and interim chair of the Department of Central Eurasia Studies. And also he's the director of Inner Asia and Euralic National Resource Center at Indiana University. Well, Professor, again, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and thank you so much for taking your time to be on the show. Really appreciate your time and we'd love to have you back on the show as we continue to pay attention to the nation of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Of course, we're looking at this long-term economic relationship with China and also other countries. So thank you so much for doing this. Great pleasure and I hope you'll be back soon and I hope we will also meet in Beijing. I will be there beginning of November. So if you're around, Let's certainly meet up. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to seeing the opportunity. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you so much.